Leaving Suriname, we took a canoe three miles across the chocolate-covered Moroni River, entering French Guiana, nicknamed simply Guion. Guion has been a colony of France since 1814, preferring now to call it simply a department of France. Here in Saint Laurent de Moroni, we take up the trail of Papillon, the greatest story of prison escape ever told. Papillon was written by Frenchman Henri Cherrier. Richard is an admirer of Papillon, still having his I childhood have a copy from 1973. Copy of the book Papillon, which I bought in the 1970s. Papillon means and butterfly in French. Cherrier had a tattoo of a butterfly on his chest. It is a story of a safe cracker in France who in 1930 was convicted of a murder he denies committing and sent to the brutal penal colony in Guyon, known as the Bagnet, headquartered in Saint Laurent. But because of his love of freedom, he lived a life of caval, a French word meaning a life of pure freedom and escape from societal softness. After several cavals, he finally escaped permanently and wrote down his incredible, if not improbable, exploits which include eight escapes, bedding several women, finding dozens of pearls, and assisted by nearly everyone he asks help of, including Catholic nuns and police officers. It was a bestseller in France, and in 1973 adopted as a $20 million Hollywood movie, starring Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. Our local guide is a mainland French woman. Mainland French are the majority here. So we are in the transportation camp of Saint Laurent du Maroni. This city was built just for uh, the penal colony. And uh, here, 52,000 prisoners came. Uh, so that was the capital city of the penal colony in Guyane. In the early 1800s, France deported thousands of its citizens and forced slaves to build up its colony here. But four years after slavery was abolished in 1848, France opened this penal colony, known as the cruelest in the world. Under Napoleon's orders, the prisoners acted as settlers to build up Guyon for France. These aerial images show how large the penal colony was. You can see the sprawl of decaying jail buildings and ancient cell blocks. In the 1950s, after 60,000 prisoners had passed through its gates, the prison was finally closed following reports of its atrocious conditions of malnutrition, malaria, brutality, and murder. Only 2,000 would return alive. For this, it earned its name as the dry guillotine. But real guillotines were also used. Some 250 inmates were punished with decapitation for bad behavior. Accurately shown in the film Papillon, prisoners were forced to kneel and watch each decapitation without turning their head or showing signs of disgust and fear. The bald man in this photo is a former prisoner who held the job as executioner, killing dozens of his brother inmates. The guillotine was set on this rock slab. So after each execution, the executioner took the head by the ears and he said, justice is done. So that was what they wanted to show to the, to the prisoners here. So now I'm lying where the prisoners slept at night. So this was the pillow, and they were chained to this uh, stick here from, f from uh, 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. every night. It was difficult, but it was also safer because otherwise they killed themselves and they Kill raped each other in so there. What is that? So yeah. this is the bathroom, yes. The love room, as they call it. Yes, they couldn't, they couldn't use it. So when they had dysentery. So they crapped on themselves. Mm. And uh, they, they played, uh, because um, I think they finished their day at six, so they had some free time here. So they played cards also. They played for money. Uh, some of them were prostitutes for money. 
They have their plan. A plan is a vial containing money hidden in the rectum. And, uh, um, sometimes they were mur murdered inside there. They, they took, uh, they were, uh, uh, yes, cut open to take the, to take the, the thing. Henry Cherrier faced such appalling conditions, having spent years in a dark isolation cell, nearly losing his mind. And it's amazing that this is the cell that Papillon was in. Um, it's a solitary confinement cell um, for prisoners who committed bad acts, and his name is engraved on the floor. So Papillon has always been kind of like a hero to me. I mean, um, they could not, they, I guess meaning the French penal system, in French Guiana they could not break him. And he finally did escape. And it's just such a, to me, a fascinating story of uh, the human spirit. We headed over to the Office of Archives to learn more about Henri Papillon Cherrier. <laughs> Et there he is. Uh, but I think it's a classic photo. Yes. Producers, directors, you know, were putting together the movie in 1971-72. And Papillon helped in the, um, you know, probably with the script of the movie, the accuracy of the movie. You know, they, uh, they meaning Hollywood, consulted with him, you know, about, you know, what happened. And it's sad to think in a way that, you know, he died in 1973, so he did not actually see the success of the movie. I mean, it, from my memory, I saw the movie when I was 13, and it was, from what I, what I remember, a very successful movie when it came out, and unfortunately, he did not see, live to see the success of the movie about his life. And uh, here are pictures. This is when he came back to the bagne after, uh, after years. So this is him uh, coming back to the bagne. You can see this brick with AP, which means Administration Penitentiary. This is this, where he, he was when he first evaded, uh, escaped. Papillon first escaped with a boat he obtained from lepers on Lepers Island, just offshore from the prison. The lepers provided a boat to Papillon after he befriended them. We are on Lepers Island, which is in the middle of the Moroni River. The Moroni River separates French Guiana from Suriname. And on this island, Papillon and his fellow prisoners he escaped with on his first escape landed here. And the reason they came here was because the boat they had was in really bad condition. And from here, they were planning to go out to open sea. And they were given advice that the lepers could help them get a better boat. It's possible that uh, Papillon came in a place like this after escaping to join the Maroni River. He escaped through a piranha-infested marsh flowing into the Maroni River directly opposite the prison and despite being shot at by guards, eventually made it to open sea in his first great caval. After weeks at sea, he arrived in San Fernando, Trinidad. These are aerial images of San Fernando Hill. From this hill, you could have seen Papillon sail into the port below. This image shows how San Fernando looked when he arrived. Today, Papillon would have been arrested on sight and extradited to French Guiana. But back then, there was no Interpol or extradition, and the police welcomed him, even as an escaped convict. But his first caval ended badly. He was captured in Colombia and returned to French Guiana. We left Saint Laurent and drove east to Carew on the road the prisoners built, which they called Route Zero, 
a sadistic and futile work assignment in the jungle that killed most that worked on it. The symbolic end of the road is kilometer 40, referred to as the green hell. Now we're at kilometer 40 on the road number one, or the road number zero, as the prisoners called it. Um, th this construction uh, costed many lives among uh, the prisoners, uh, several thousands, um, as they worked uh, with bare feet and they were beaten by insects and had fevers and they were under uh, fed, so that was difficult for them. We know that uh, it took 20 years for the road to, to be uh, 24 kilometers long. So that's about one kilometer for a year. The French government later finished the road and we continued on it to Karoo, where we then sailed out to the Ilés du Salut. The Ilés du Salut, or Salvation Islands, are three islands in the penal system. San Joseph was for punishment, San Royal for former escapees, and Devil's Island for France's political prisoners. Later, we visit Joseph and Royal that housed the bulk of its prisoners, but we first sailed around the mysterious Devil's Island, where entry is illegal and will subject one to arrest. Devil's Island had only a handful of prisoners, at times only one. On Devil's Island, the prisoners lived in small huts with no view and were not allowed to speak. There was a wire pulley to transfer food from the main island every day but they were otherwise left completely alone. The famous Jewish prisoner, Alfred Dreyfus, accused of giving French military secrets to the Germans, but later fully vindicated, was imprisoned here in the late 1800s, shackled at night, unable to twist and turn, flesh eaten by bats. So profound is my solitude, he wrote, I often seem to be lying in a tomb. We then landed on Ile Royale. Today it is hard to imagine the brutality that once existed here as the island is being developed for tourists with a restaurant and um, rebuilt cell now blocks. Now we're in the place where the prisoners were um, imprisoned uh, uh, in uh, isolation and in the dark. So in these cells they were kept and um, they had a, a bed and they were tied to their bed uh, thanks to an iron loop. They also had two buckets, one with clean water to drink and wash and one for their uh, personal needs. Um, here the, um, the diet was uh, very harsh, okay, they only uh, had proper food every three days. Okay. In the two other days, they only had uh, bread and water. The third day, they had uh, a soup, which was not uh, a lot more uh, nutritive. So their food was given to them through this hole. Uh, and they were also shaved. So here they were imprisoned in their cells uh, 23 hours a day. Twice a day, they had 30 minutes, a 30 minutes walk uh, in this uh, little yard and uh, they had to look at the floor and they couldn't speak to each other. So twice a day they would uh, do this little round. We then went to Ile San Joseph. The island is called the Silent One after Saint Joseph who had no words attributed to him in the Gospels. The prisoners called the island the devourer of men. Devoid of tourists and development we immediately felt the presence of the extreme pain once inflicted here. After his escape, Papillon was sentenced to the reclusion discipline here. Prisoners were forbidden to speak and locked inside completely dark, solitary confinement cells. Men were reduced to mindless, emaciated animals hoping to die. Their ghosts are everywhere in the crumbling, wet ruins.
This is one of the isolation cells where uh, Papillon has been after escaping. So he was sent to uh, this uh, camp. You can see uh, that the ceiling was uh, a grill where the guards could walk to watch them. It is said that uh, the guards used to urinate or spit on uh, the prisoners uh, while they, they were in their cells from the, from the ceiling. Um, when uh, the prisoner was punished, to punish the, the prisoner, the guards would close uh, the ceiling with a, a large plank so that uh, the cell was completely dark. After a few weeks, the prisoners could become blind. There was a graveyard here for the guards and their families, cut out from the immense growth of the jungle. But now the wild of Guyan is taking back the Bagne. The prisoners were not given a proper burial. Upon their death, the local church bell would ring out. Guards would then dump the body in the sea. The sharks knew from the bell it was feeding time. They would surround the boat and quickly devour the body. The French treated these men as animals. I am sure the real Saint Joseph is angry at this lack of respect for man, as would the founders of the great enlightenment born in France just a hundred years earlier. Papillon witnessed his best friend being devoured in this way, the shark spinning his friend in the air, ripping off limb by limb, Seeing this horrific scene, he committed himself to one final pure caval. He would make a raft of coconuts and either float to mainland Guyan, 15 miles away, or drown trying. On this final caval, he found himself, his faith, and finally his new life of freedom. I thought, God is with you today, Poppy. In the midst of nature's monstrous elements, in the wind, the immenseness of the sea, the depth of the waves, you feel your own infinitesimal smallness, and perhaps it's here, without looking for him, that you find God. I had sensed him at night during the thousands of hours I spent buried alive in dank dungeons without a ray of sun. I touched him today, in a sun that would devour everything too weak to resist it. I touched God, I felt him around me, he even whispered in my ear, you suffer you will suffer more, but this time I am on your side. You will be free, you will, I promise you. His final pure caval was a success. He escaped for good to Venezuela. After decades of being imprisoned, he found his way to Caracas and began a new life. He settled here, married, had children, and started a restaurant that still stands today, the Grand Café. Okay, oh, there he is. Yes, yeah, Papillon. Oh, cool. Here we are in Caracas, Venezuela, at the Grand Cafe, which was started by Papillon after he escaped from the uh, French penal system in French Guiana. And here is Papillon at the Grand Cafe. Who knows exactly when this picture was taken, but many, many decades ago. And um, he's dressed pretty sharply. Um, so anyway, um, he finally ended up in Caracas and traveled the world. So it's really cool to be here in Caracas at his, the cafe that he started. Um, and it's quite filled up with people, so it's still going quite a bit. It's the cafe that he started after he escaped. So uh, he became an entrepreneur, which is kind of interesting. So anyway, it's really neat to be here. Our story of the wild coast ends here in Venezuela as it ended for Cherrier. In this beautiful land lies Angel Falls, the tallest waterfall in the world, nearly one mile high. The greatest symbol of natural, untamed freedom in all of South America, if not the world. 
It is ironic that Venezuela's current socialist government is today imprisoning men like Cherier, freedom-loving entrepreneurs who they once welcomed. And in its latest bizarre twist to make all things part of its Bolivarian revolution, they have attempted to rename these falls after Hugo Chavez. But Venezuela too will learn that one cannot repress pure freedom. It cannot impose its Bolivarian revolution on pure cabal. The falls will always recapture what belongs to them. In the sight of this majesty, we are forced to accept that something higher will forever flow. That neither a repressive, suicidal Marxist cult, nor brutal ethnic war, nor slavery, nor false imprisonment, nor Bolivarian revolutions can overcome. It is in these falls we feel our freedom its power rushing into our souls. <laughs>